Number 9. Mulberry Harbors On June 6, 1944, 156,000 Allied troops descended on the coast of Normandy, France in a mission to free the country from Nazi control. Famously known as D-Day, it was the largest seaborne invasion in recorded history. To facilitate the rapid offloading of supplies, troops, and vehicles, the Allies placed portable harbors at Omaha Beach and Gold Beach. These portable harbors were known as Mulberry Harbors, and they were developed by the United Kingdom. The structures were towed across the English Channel in sections and assembled at their respective sites. Each harbor consisted of steel roadways that floated on steel and concrete pontoons. They were meant to be used for three months, but the harbor at Gold Beach, known as Mulberry Harbor B, or Port Winston, ended up being used for 10 long months, unloading as much as 18,000 tons of supplies daily. Its remnants are still visible today. Mulberry Harbor A was only partially built when it was severely damaged in a storm. It was abandoned the same month the harbors were put in place. Number 8. A Fish Far From Home Headlines around the world created an uproar in early 2019 when a rare hoodwinker fish washed ashore at the Cold Oil Point Reserve near Santa Barbara, California. To make things even weirder, the incredibly strange-looking specimen was found thousands of miles outside its normal range in the Southern Hemisphere. At first, conservation specialist Jessica Nielsen thought the seven-foot creature was an ocean sunfish, noting in a Facebook post that it was even taller than it was long. When he saw Nielsen's photo, marine biologist Thomas Turner rushed to the beach to get a first-hand look at the fish. He posted photos of it online, and they caught the attention of Australian researchers, who speculated that it was a hoodwinker fish. Marine scientist Marianne Nygaard, who discovered and named the species in 2013, was tagged in the photo. She told the USA Today that she nearly fell off her chair when she first saw the image. Nygaard visually confirmed the species, which was later verified through DNA testing. The hoodwinker is one of five species of sunfish. Known for their large size and unusual shape, sunfish are considered the world's heaviest bony fish. They grow shockingly fast, reaching as much as 800 pounds during their first 15 months of life. While it's not the largest of the sunfish, the hoodwinker is still pretty huge, weighing up to 2.2 tons by adulthood. Although it's rarely spotted, documented sightings of it date back to the 19th century. The beached specimen is one of several that have appeared in and around Monterey Bay, far from where they're usually seen off New Zealand and Australia. Scientists are unsure why some have traveled such a vast distance, but they suspect that the uncharacteristic movements are somehow tied to climate change. Number 7. Abandoned Bunkers During the 19th and 20th centuries when Russia was under Tsarist rule, a series of concrete bunkers were built along what is now the Latvian coast. Known as the Lipaya Northern Forts, they once surrounded the city of Lipaya and functioned as part of its central fortress. The buildings were abandoned in 1908, barely a decade after they were finished being built. Officials decided to desert them after identifying them as a strategic mistake according to Latvia's official tourism website. Attempts to demolish the bunkers with explosives were only partially successful. Today, the beach remains littered with the crumbling ruins of the structures that survived the blast. But the Baltic Sea seems to be taking over with the unfinished demolition work. Some of the forts have collapsed, others are left standing for now, but it's only a matter of time before they too succumb to the forces of nature. Tourists can take guided tours of the La Paya Northern Forts, where they'll participate in a game called Escape from the USSR. It's more or less a mock scenario in which tourists search for a missing friend who was kidnapped by the Soviets. To many, the game sounds too eerily realistic to seem like a fun idea. What do you think? Are you up for a round? Or would you prefer to sit out the imaginary crisis? Let me know in the comments down below. Number 6. Deceptive Dummy A volunteer named Kathleen received the scare of a lifetime earlier this year at Perdido Key in the Florida Panhandle. While helping to clean the beach with an organization called Ocean Hour, she spotted what initially looked like a decapitated corpse covered in seaweed and barnacles. The sight was convincing enough at first glance for a fellow volunteer to dial 911. But Kathleen mustered up the courage to take a closer look and found, much to her relief and to the relief of concerned onlookers, that she hadn't discovered a corpse after all. It was a mannequin, so it makes perfect sense why Kathleen thought she'd encountered a headless human body and why the people around her also panicked. Nobody ever figured out why or how the mannequin ended up on the beach, but it probably spent a lot of time in the water to end up encrusted in sea life, according to a Facebook post by Ocean Hour. Everyone involved in the cleanup was reportedly glad to learn that it wasn't a corpse, and it was removed as part of the organization's beach cleaning efforts. Number 5. Bizarre Dead Dolphin 
In early 2020, visitors at Destiladeras Beach in the Mexican state of Jalisco were shocked to discover an eyeless, finless, dolphin-like creature with sharp teeth and an eel-like tail. Disturbing images of the dead creature went viral on social media, sparking a widespread frenzy to figure out what exactly it was and why it looked the way it did. Based on the animal's lack of eyes, locals speculated that it was a deep-dwelling species that lives in total darkness and has evolved to survive without eyesight. But even experienced fishermen were unable to identify it when asked by the media if they knew what it was. They did point out that there's an area of the ocean nearby in Puerto Vallarta, measuring thousands of feet deep. Perhaps that's where the strange creature came from. Although the bizarre being was never formally identified, social media users were quick to share their opinions. One person suggested that the carcass belonged to an eel that became bloated while it decomposed, making it look more like a dolphin. What do you think it was? Let us know in the comments below, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 4. Rare Football Fish Earlier this year, a jet black football-shaped fish with dozens of razor-sharp teeth washed ashore on California's Newport Beach. A beachgoer discovered the terrifying 18-inch long creature laying in the sand. Known as the Pacific football fish, the species isn't rare, but it's seldom seen because it lives more than 3,000 feet below the water's surface. It's one of around 200 known anglerfish species and dwells in complete darkness where food is scarce. As an ambush predator, it lures its prey using a bioluminescent fishing rod-like appendage that protrudes from its forehead. Only female anglerfish, who grow up to two feet long, have this appendage. Males only reach up to an inch in length and exist solely to procreate. As sexual parasites, they latch on to a female's body and fuse to her until all that's left of them are their reproductive organs, which enable her to bear offspring. Nobody knows how a Pacific football fish ended up on Newport Beach back in May. California Department of Fish and Wildlife employee Joe Ugortez told the Los Angeles Times that it's uncommon, but not entirely unheard of, for deep sea fish to wash ashore. And while many people think it looks like something out of a nightmare or a horror movie, the ability to study the fish up close was a rare treat for scientists. To their surprise, they recently got another chance to do this. In the last month, three deep sea fish have washed ashore in San Diego County. One of them was a 13-inch long Pacific football fish. And even though several of them have been found in recent months, experts still say it's an incredibly rare occurrence. Before this year, the last time a specimen that was in good enough condition for scientific study appeared on a California beach was 20 years ago. Number 3. Extremely Rare Seashell The Junonia snail is a large deep-water sea snail that lives in the Gulf of Mexico at depths between 95 and 413 feet. Because it lives miles from the coast, its seashell typically only appears on shore after a hurricane or a strong storm. So it's rare for beachgoers to come across one of these highly coveted cream-colored shells, which are covered in spiraling rows of squarish brown dots. But it does happen from time to time. While walking along the shore of Sanibel Island off Fort Myers recently, a tourist from Ohio named Carolyn Kaplan spotted the Junonia shell's distinct pattern in the sand. At the time, she was with another shell seeker, whom she warned, you're gonna freak out before plucking the shell off the ground. After vacationing at Sanibel Island for 45 years and having spent 17 years living in Key Largo before returning to Cleveland, Kaplan had all but given up hope of ever finding a Junonia shell. Another Ohio resident named Bonnie Sippy discovered one of the highly sought-after shells on Sanibel Island in September during a vacation away from Cincinnati. Unlike Kaplan, she had no idea that the Junonia shell was so rare when she found it. She simply thought it looked cool. A little while later, a fellow visitor was describing the Junonia shell to Sippy when she realized she had one in her possession. Bonnie told the Sanibel Captiva that without the stranger's help, she would have never realized she found something so unique and hard to come by. Number 2. Narluga Skull Almost 30 years ago in 1990, a hunter spotted three strange-looking whales swimming off the coast of western Greenland. He managed to get his hands on one of the creature's skulls, and it was unlike anything he'd ever seen before. Researcher Mess Peter Heide Jorgensen suspected that the specimen was a hybrid between a narwhal and a beluga. Others speculated that it was a beluga with a defect or disorder of some type. At the time, DNA technology simply wasn't advanced enough to say for sure. For the next several decades, the skull sat at storage at the Natural History Museum of Denmark. In 2015, curator Aline Lorentzen decided to take a second look at it. DNA technology had come a long way since the early 90s, and scientists managed to extract a usable sample. It turned out that the creature was indeed a hybrid. Born to a narwhal mother and a beluga father, it possessed a bizarre combination of traits from both. 
The weird whale had beluga-like teeth, as well as a twisted leftward spiraling bottom row of narwhal-like chompers. It lacked the narwhal's characteristic horn, though. Scientists had written in a 1993 study that the animal's teeth were unlike any known species, but that they seemed fitting for both narwhals and belugas. The DNA findings simply confirmed that the team was on the right track with their suspicions after all. Whale researcher Travis Park, who was not involved in any of the studies, described the skull as almost exactly what you'd imagine you'd get if you mixed a beluga and a narwhal together. He added that genetics don't usually work out so cleanly. The skull is the first solid evidence that narlugas are actually a real thing. Until the discovery, experts believed that it was nearly impossible for belugas and narwhals to mate, despite being members of the same family. The two species diverged from a common ancestor around five and a half million years ago, and their shared gene flow ended roughly 1.25 million years ago, making it surprising that they managed to interbreed after so long. An isotope analysis of the animal's teeth shows that it dove deeper than either of its parents in search of food, but besides that, researchers know almost nothing else about it, and nobody has seen one since. Number 1. Dead Seal Colony Late last year, scientists announced the disturbing discovery of 7,000 dead Cape fur seals in central Namibia. The carcasses, which came from the Pelican Point colony, began appearing in September of 2020, according to conservationist Nauda Dreyer, who works for the nonprofit Ocean Conservation. A month later, Dreyer spotted an alarming number of dead seal fetuses from the same colony. An estimated 5,000 to 7,000 female seals had miscarried, leaving the coast littered with dead baby and adult seals. Female Cape fur seals typically give birth between mid-November and mid-December. In the words of Dr. Tess Gridley of the Namibian Dolphin Project, some of the carcasses appeared thin-looking, emaciated, with very little fat reserves. Experts are at a loss to explain what caused the massive die-off. They have several theories citing pollution, bacterial infection, and malnutrition as possible factors. This isn't the first time seals have died in mass along the Namibian coast. Back in 1994, around 10,000 adults and 15,000 fetuses died in the region. Scientists suspected that food shortage and bacterial infection were to blame. But much like the uncertainty revolving around the more recent deaths, they don't know for sure. Number 8. Kursk Nuclear Submarine Disaster While carrying out training exercises in the Barents Sea in 2000, Captain Gennady Petrovich Lyachin ordered the crew of the nuclear submarine he was commanding to fire two torpedoes. It was the first major Russian naval exercise in over a decade, and unfortunately, it would also turn out to be one of the deadliest. The submarine, known as the Kursk, had a reputation for being unsinkable, but it proved otherwise that day when the training exercise went terrifyingly wrong. A hydrogen peroxide leak caused a massive fire in the torpedo room, resulting in two large explosions, and the Kursk sank to the bottom of the sea. The Russian government initially reported that all 118 crew members died before the submarine sank to its watery grave. But a note found in the pocket of Lieutenant Dmitry Kolesnikov's uniform explained that 23 men had survived the two explosions. They stayed alive for several hours, but were completely helpless while they waited for rescue that never came. In the meantime, the sailors searched for more oxygen, causing another fire in the process. The flames consumed what was left of the oxygen, and sadly, all 23 surviving crew members died. In the aftermath of the tragedy, the Russian Navy was heavily criticized not only for lying about there being no initial survivors, but for not doing enough to rescue them. It was also made clear that the military was obviously ill-prepared for a nuclear submarine disaster. Number 7. One of the best snipers of all time. Sima Haya grew up on a family farm in southern Finland near the Russian border. At the age of 17, he joined a voluntary militia called the Finnish White Guard. He then went on to serve in the Finnish army where he proved to be an expert marksman. Haya trained as a sniper starting in 1938. The following year, the Winter War broke out between Finland and the Soviet Union. He remained largely out of sight while he quietly killed hundreds of enemy soldiers over a 98-day span averaging around five kills per day amid frigid sub-zero temperatures and limited daylight hours. Haya achieved his highest daily kill count of 25 on December 2, 1939. In his journal, which was found in 2017, he estimated his total kills at around 500. According to various military records, he killed somewhere between 438 and 518 people. Some historians are skeptical of these numbers, but there's also no evidence to suggest that Haya deliberately exaggerated and it's generally agreed upon that he was responsible for at least 200 kills. 
Hayao was humble about his accomplishments and never spoke of his wartime activities. But the Finnish press used him as a propaganda tool starting pretty early on in the war, crafting a hero narrative around a man who was just doing his job and happened to be exceptionally good at it. Number 6. Desmond Doss As a devout Seventh-day Adventist, Desmond Doss was a conscientious objector which means that he refused to participate in certain aspects of military service due to his religion. While training as a combat medic during World War II, he refused to carry a weapon or to kill an enemy soldier. His superiors ridiculed and abused him for his beliefs and even tried to get Doss kicked out of the military. But he nevertheless went on to serve and was awarded for his exceptional service. In 1944, he received two Bronze Star Medals with a V device for exceptional valor while serving in Guam and the Philippines. During the Battle of Okinawa, Doss saved the lives of somewhere between 50 and 100 soldiers in an area known as Hacksaw Ridge. In 1945, he became the first conscientious objector to receive the Medal of Honor. Doss displayed true heroism by continuing to treat other soldiers while suffering from injuries himself. He spent five years recovering after the war and lost a long battle with tuberculosis. Because he was unable to work full-time, Doss devoted much of his life to his church. He lived at the age of 87, passing away in 2006 after being hospitalized for breathing difficulties. Have you ever heard of Desmond Doss? If this story is the first time you've heard his name and his story sounds interesting to you, you should check out the movie Hacksaw Ridge. It's about his incredible story. Have you seen it before? Let us know in the comments below, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 5. The First Navy SEAL Lieutenant J.G. Jack Hendrick Taylor was originally an orthodontist who practiced in Hollywood, California. But like many other brave men and women, he was inspired to make a drastic career change after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, and enlisted in the U.S. Navy. As an experienced yachtsman, Taylor was originally slated to teach seafaring skills to new soldiers, but he ended up being assigned to an anti-submarine warfare vessel called a submarine chaser. Then in 1942, Taylor was recruited as a member of the Office of Strategic Services, a newly established military intelligence agency. He joined the organization's maritime unit, which is often thought of as a precursor to the Navy SEALs. Throughout the rest of his military service, Taylor underwent ocean operations in Greece, land operations in Albania, and a parachute drop into Austria. He commanded dangerous missions delivering spies, weapons, explosives, and other supplies to Allied forces in enemy-occupied territory. At one point, Taylor was captured and sent to Mauthausen, a notorious concentration camp with a reputation for its cruelty and deplorable conditions. He was one of the only American prisoners there, and he gathered intelligence during his stay while witnessing countless brutal executions of his fellow inmates. Taylor himself was scheduled for execution twice, but managed to narrowly escape death both times. He became informally known to many as the first Navy SEAL for the various types of service he performed throughout the war, and was also one of few Americans who could speak firsthand about the atrocities they witnessed at Nazi-run concentration camps. Number 4. The Man Who Served Under Three Flags In 1954, a man in his mid-30s who called himself Larry Thorne enlisted as a private in the U.S. Army. His real name was Larry Torney, and he had already been a soldier for nearly his entire adult life. He first enlisted as a soldier for the Finnish Army in 1938 at 19 years old. Torney was a natural leader and soon found himself in charge of a unit that pursued its enemies on skis. In 1942, he skied into a mine and was severely injured, but was soon back to work. His service against the Soviets during World War II would later earn him a distinguished military award called the Mannerheim Cross. After Finland and the Soviet Union agreed to a ceasefire in 1944, Torney joined the German SS. British forces arrested him at the end of the war for being a Nazi officer and threw him into a POW camp. He escaped and fled to Finland, where he was arrested yet again. Torney was released in 1948 after serving just part of his sentence. He was one of several hundred Eastern Europeans who joined the U.S. military under a law that granted foreigners citizenship in exchange for five years of service. But Torney was still being pursued for his war crimes, so he changed his name to Larry Thorne to avoid having his real identity found out. He did extremely well as an American soldier, teaching new recruits about guerrilla warfare and survival skills, and eventually became a captain in the Special Forces. Thorne died in the Vietnam War in 1965 after losing control of a helicopter he was flying during a storm. He received five Purple Hearts and the Bronze Star Medal for his heroic acts. Number 3. The Prisoner Who Entered Auschwitz Voluntarily Witold Pilecki was a captain in the Polish Army. 
During the early stages of World War II, he did the unthinkable and voluntarily became a prisoner at Auschwitz as part of a mission to expose the horrors that went on there. Pilecki had heard things about atrocities being committed at the concentration camp, but the Nazis were secretive about what happened behind the gates, so nobody knew for sure if the rumors were true. In 1940, at the age of 39, Pilecki immersed himself into a group of around 2,000 Poles as they were being rounded up for relocation to Auschwitz. Immediately upon arriving, he realized that it was no ordinary prison. He witnessed brutal executions that were carried out in plain sight while performing grueling labor, wheelbarrowing rocks around. It's believed that the rocks may have been used for building the camp's gas chambers or crematorium. In the meantime, Pilecki realized that the prisoners were only being given enough food to survive for roughly six weeks. Anyone who lived longer than that must have stolen food, according to a guard, and the punishment for stealing was execution. During his time at Auschwitz, Pilecki organized a Polish resistance among the prisoners, which coordinated with a resistance effort on the outside. They coordinated to look after each other's food rations and to get correspondence out of the prison and to Pilecki's commanding officer. By 1942, the clandestine organization consisted of around 500 members. Pilecki hoped that his reports would compel the resistance to try rescuing the prisoners at Auschwitz. Sadly, they thought he was exaggerating about the conditions there, leaving Pilecki and his comrades to fend for themselves. After enduring the hellish reality of the concentration camp for nearly three years, he snuck away under the cover of night while a guard wasn't paying attention. Most prisoners survived no longer than 42 days at Auschwitz. Pilecki spent 947 days there enduring indescribable abuse, malnutrition, and exhausting labor. When he reached the resistance on the outside, he learned that his commanding officer had been replaced. The new man in charge had no interest in taking Auschwitz down from the inside, and it seemed as if Pilecki had suffered for no reason. He continued to serve in the Polish military and ended up in another German prison camp, but not voluntarily this time around. Thankfully, the U.S. military liberated the camp in 1945, and Pilecki was rescued. But he met a tragic end a few years later when the Soviets accused him of betraying state intelligence and executed him. Pilecki's written account of the unspeakable acts he witnessed in Auschwitz was published as a book called The Auschwitz Volunteer Beyond Bravery. Sadly, the importance of his work went largely unnoticed until years after his death, when the damage was done and it was much too late to put an end to the crimes against humanity that the Nazis committed at cruel concentration camps. It's a sobering example of truth to be found in the saying that hindsight is 2020. Number 2. The Toughest Man Alive David Goggins was born in 1975. He grew up in Buffalo, New York, where he experienced his fair share of challenges starting at a young age, including racism. At just six years old, he started working at his family's skating rink. Goggins was accepted into United States Air Force pararescue training after failing the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery Test twice. He struggled with the program's swimming requirements and was ultimately let go after testing positive for a genetic condition called sickle cell trait. But Goggins didn't let this or any of his other challenges stop him from becoming one of the toughest warriors of all time. He returned to the Air Force, completed tactical air control party training, and worked the position from 1994 until he left the military in 1999. After his service ended, Goggins struggled with depression and obesity, reaching nearly 300 pounds. But a documentary about the most difficult part of Navy SEAL training known as Hell Week proved to be life-changing. It inspired Goggins to join the Navy despite being much older than the average recruit, and it took him several tries to convince a recruiter just to give him a chance. He successfully completed Hell Week in 2001, suffering from pneumonia and stress fractures along the way. Goggins served in Iraq as part of SEAL Team 5. Then in 2004, he graduated from Army Ranger School. He received the Top Honor Man Award and is the only member of the American Armed Forces to complete TACP training, SEAL training, and Ranger School. The unstoppable soldier is also an accomplished endurance athlete. He's completed over 60 marathons and triathlons, many of which involved running over 100 miles, regularly placing among the top five. Goggins even finished the Badwater 35, a 135-mile mountainous run in the extreme heat that many consider to be the most challenging race on Earth. And he holds a 2013 Guinness World Record for completing 4,030 pull-ups in 17 hours. Number 1. Diprasad Pun Sergeant Diprasad Pun is a member of the Royal Gurkha Rifles, an elite British Army rifle regiment that recruits Nepalese soldiers. These warriors are known for their exceptional bravery and skill. 
While on sentry duty outside his unit's compound in Afghanistan one night in September 2010, Sergeant Pun discovered a pair of insurgents trying to lay an IED, improvised explosive device, in a nearby road. He quickly realized that he was surrounded by Taliban fighters armed with AK-47s and RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades. They launched a well-planned assault on the post. Pun fought back against the attackers using every weapon available to him. He shot his machine gun until it ran out of ammo, then tossed 17 hand grenades and a landmine at the enemy before resorting to his SA-80 service rifle. At one point, a Taliban fighter climbed onto the roof of a nearby building and rushed toward Pun, whose weapon misfired. The quick-thinking soldier took the tripod that was used for holding his machine gun and threw it at his adversary's face, knocking him off the building. Pun continued to fight alone, leaving as many as 30 Taliban soldiers dead by the time reinforcements arrived. He received the conspicuous gallantry cross from Queen Elizabeth II for his courageous and vigilant actions. At the ceremony, he said he had no choice but to fight, and that he thought he was going to die, so his goal was to kill as many Taliban soldiers as possible before they killed him. Number 9. Russian Cosmonaut Training In recent years, the tourism industry has experienced an uprise in customers who seek authentic travel experiences. Are you one of these travelers? Cruise companies have responded to this by rising demand by implementing activities and options that cater their guests' desires. In 2010, Crystal Cruises began offering single-night excursions to the Yuri Gargarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, the former Russian equivalent of NASA headquarters. Visitors get the chance to train just like a Russian cosmonaut, experiencing weightlessness, g-forces, and other things that modern-day researchers have to go through before they're sent into space. But this taste of authenticity comes at a pretty penny, with the company's four packages ranging in price from $4,360 to around $33,000. Founded half a century ago in 1960, the Cosmonaut Training Center was originally a top-secret Soviet Air Force facility. It's located in a wooded area outside of Moscow and is Russia's only cosmonaut school. The site was built during a period of the Cold War known as the Space Race, when the United States and the Soviet Union competed to develop superior space technology and to beat the other to achieving certain milestones like traveling to the moon. Staff went out of their way to ensure that the cosmonauts received the best training that money and technology could afford. Their well-being was a top priority, especially since they were being entrusted with leading the Soviet Union in the space race against the country's top enemy at the time. In order to survive in space, cosmonauts had to know what they were doing and be in peak physical health. At the training center, they underwent medical testing and observation, zero-gravity simulations, and everything else they needed in order to be ready for their journey into space. Number 8. Robotic Infantry Mules one of the biggest challenges to a soldier's health and performance is the weight of the equipment they have to carry. In 2009, DARPA teamed up with robotics company Boston Dynamics to create the Legged Squad Support System, an autonomous robot that would function as a pack horse for soldiers and Marines. Also known as the LS3 or the Alpha Dog, it was designed to withstand a variety of challenging conditions including heat, cold, moisture, and dirt. The robot is capable of carrying 400 pounds of supplies while also maneuvering efficiently and quietly over difficult terrain. It's roughly the size of a horse and is capable of following a human lead while using its sophisticated technology to gather intelligence. The LS3 did well in several tests and improved vastly throughout the first several years of the project. In 2014, the U.S. Marines used it in a realistic combat exercise during which it was tasked with resupplying troops in several difficult-to-reach settings. To the surprise of skeptics, the robot proved capable of handling 70 to 80 percent of the terrain and was almost always able to right itself when it fell. Development continued into the following year, at which point the military decided to shelve the project. As promising as the LS-3 was, it was limited by loud noise as well as difficulties with performing repairs and implementing it into a marine patrol. Around $42 million was spent on the endeavor altogether, and there are no future plans to expand on it or ever put it to practical use. Number 7. A Robot That Hunts Explosives Founded in 2006, the Joint Improvised Explosive Device Defeat Organization focuses on improvised threats such as improvised explosive devices, which are commonly used as roadside bombs. As part of the effort to combat these life-threatening devices, the military has embarked on several projects to design ground robots that hunt for IEDs. One such endeavor is called the Modular Advanced Armed Robotic System, or MARS for short. Developed for one of DARPA's many robotics contests, the remote-controlled machine is equipped with cameras, sensors, a siren, a spotlight, a 
loudspeaker, a machine gun, and a rocket or grenade launcher. It weighs 369 pounds and can be equipped for lethal, less lethal, and non-lethal use. The robot can also be fitted with a manipulator arm that's capable of lifting up to 120 pounds and pulling over 300 pounds. It's capable of traveling up to 7 miles per hour and has a battery life of 3 to 12 hours, as well as a sleep mode that lasts for up to a week. Mars doesn't have the level of autonomy that would be considered ideal for its purpose and function. It doesn't understand certain basic commands, and operating it could prove to be dangerously distracting to soldiers in situations where their attention is needed elsewhere. Ideally, the system will become easier to work with, meaning it'll behave intelligently enough to not be a burden to whoever's overseeing its activity. The robot has a few other shortcomings, including the size, which tends to be a disadvantage. It's too small to knock a door in, for example, but too big to navigate through narrow corridors. Numerous improvements have been made since Mars was first conceived in 2008, but at the end of the day, it has its limitations. There are certain things it just can't do, and it requires human guidance to operate. Number 6. Self-Steering Bullets when it comes to hitting targets in harsh conditions like winds and dusty terrain, even the most skilled snipers face challenges. They're also bound by the limits of modern technology, and missing a shot can be incredibly dangerous to a sniper's own troops because it can tip the enemy off to their presence and possibly even expose their location. After taking all these factors into consideration, the U.S. military has made it a goal to enable faster and more accurate engagement of sniper targets. In 2011, DARPA collaborated with several private companies on the Exacto project, which aimed to develop the first-ever guided small-caliber bullet. The project's developers have avoided going into detail about exactly how the bullet works, but they've revealed that the system tracks and delivers the projectile to its target using both a real-time guidance system and a maneuverable bullet. The 50 caliber bullet's nose and tail contains tiny optical sensors, enabling it to rapidly change course in mid-air. A system this advanced could theoretically make even the most inexperienced shooters capable of hitting moving targets with ease. Wind gusts and other sudden environmental changes would not interfere with a shot thanks to the bullet's core correcting abilities. This futuristic technology supersedes current state-of-the-art sniper systems and greatly enhances a sniper's day and nighttime range. The system has not yet entered service, but the future of the Exacto project is promising. As of 2018, the smart bullets had passed their most advanced live fire tests. What do you think of these bullets? Do you think they'll do more harm than good? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 5. Russia's first autonomous strike drone. Two years ago, Russia's first unmanned combat aerial vehicle, the Sukhoi S-70 Okhotnik B, took flight for the first time. Nicknamed the Hunter, the drone is designed to deliver precision-guided bombs at long ranges without a pilot. It somewhat resembles the American military's B-2 stealth bomber. The Okhotnik was first spotted in early 2019 at the Chaklov Aviation Plant outside Novosibirsk, where ground trials had reportedly been underway for several months. Later that year, President Vladimir Putin visited the facility and announced that the aircraft's development was proceeding in a timely fashion. Without the need for a cockpit and equipment to perform life-sustaining functions for a human pilot, the Okhotnik has enough room for a large internal weapons bay. The technology it uses has actually been around for a while and is nothing new to the U.S. and several other militaries of the Western world. But the drone marks a milestone in the advancement of Russian military technology and the country's ability to attack heavily defended targets. According to state news agency TASS, the second Okhotnik prototype was rolled out earlier this month and preparations for its debut flight are currently underway. Back in August, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu said that the hope is that the work on the Okhotnik will be finished by the end of the year. Deliveries of the drone to the country's troops are slated to begin in 2024. Number 4. Project 1794 During the early 1950s, the U.S. Air Force aimed to develop an attack aircraft that looked like a UFO. Its designers hoped to achieve a top speed between Mach 3 and Mach 4, three to four times the speed of sound, and a maximum altitude of 100,000 feet. The documents from this bizarre top-secret endeavor known as Project 1794 were declassified in 2012. They contain plans to make the vehicle capable of vertical takeoff, meaning it would be able to take off and land just about anywhere because it wouldn't need a runway. When the project's details became public, some people wondered if they had seen the government-developed vehicle flying in the night sky and mistook it for a UFO. This was probably not the case, according to Peter Susiu. Writing for National Interest, he explained that this wasn't the first time the U.S. had tried to create a flying saucer, but that there's no evidence that any of these vehicles were capable of flying very high, far, or fast. In fact, according to records, most of them were aerodynamically unstable and barely made it more than a few feet off the ground. Simply put, Project 1794 and others like it failed. 
and were typically discontinued when the military could no longer justify their multi-million dollar price tags. Number three, improving satellite technology. Most commercial and government satellites orbit the Earth from about 22,000 miles above the ground. This is an ideal distance for providing all the information necessary for communications, meteorology, and national security services. But it's actually pretty inconvenient when it comes to performing inspections, fixing broken equipment, and upgrading outdated satellites. As things currently stand, there's really no way to combat the issue. The best scientists can do is load up a satellite with as much fuel as it can carry and as many backup systems as it can accommodate and hope that it enjoys a long life. Span. But some researchers are hoping to change all that. The Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or DARPA, has a program called Robotic Servicing of Geosynchronous Satellites. One of the project's objectives is to establish a robotic servicing vehicle that's capable of tending to broken satellites. Another DARPA program launched jointly between North Group Grumman and Raytheon aims to improve satellite technology in the interest of national security. In a nutshell, the project seeks to develop technology that's capable of seeking and hunting an enemy's satellite. If things work out in favor of the best-case scenario, the end product will destroy an enemy satellite over the course of several weeks by reflecting a sunbeam on it. The idea is to attack the satellite with intense heat, causing it to combust or fall out of orbit. Number 2. Mechanical Elephants During the Vietnam War, American troops had to traverse through dense jungle terrain, but they weren't used to it, and thinkers over at DARPA began trying to figure out what could make it easier for soldiers to move more efficiently through the unfamiliar environment. One idea they came up with was to build mechanical elephants that would carry heavy loads of equipment unimpeded by thick vegetation. The plans called for a narrow trail vehicle, NTV, that is capable of transporting personnel and cargo in mountainous terrain along narrow winding jungle trails with steep slopes and across small marshes and shallow rivers and streams. But this vision didn't go very far before DARPA director Eberhard Reshton caught wind of it. He reportedly shut the project down immediately, hoping that Congress hadn't found out about it yet, fearing that they would cut the agency's funding. DARPA is known for sponsoring unconventional high-risk projects that often fail or ultimately prove to be impractical. And the mechanical elephant was just one of several proposed ideas for developing robotic animals or technology with animal-inspired features that would give troops an upper hand over their enemy in one way or another. In the early 2000s, researchers began working to create a robotic canine for the army known as Big Dog. Unlike the mechanical elephant, this project actually made it past the planning stages. Roughly the size of a small mule, the mechanical dog was capable of running at up to 4 miles per hour and could carry up to 340 pounds of gear. But the big dog's gas engine was ultimately deemed too loud for the robot to be used during combat, and the project was discontinued in 2015. Scientists at DARPA created a quieter dog nicknamed Spot, but it was much smaller than the big dog and could only carry 40 pounds of equipment, rendering it pretty useless on the battlefield. Number 1. Unmanned Submarine Hunter In recent years, militaries throughout the world have been developing increasingly quiet submarines that are capable of remaining undetected very close to shore. To keep up with this advancing technology, DARPA launched the Anti-Submarine Warfare Continuous Trail Unmanned Vessel, or ACTUV program, also known as the Sea Hunter. The vision is to create a water-based drone that's capable of traversing thousands of miles of open sea for months at a time without a single crew member aboard. Its purpose is to hunt submarines while navigating autonomously through narrow channels and shipping traffic using sonar, radar, and other systems that can get the job done without needing an actual person at the helm. Open water testing of the technology began in 2016, and in early 2018, DARPA announced the successful completion of the program. It was then handed over to the Office of Naval Research for further development of the prototype vehicle. DARPA program manager Alexander Wayland praised the transition between agencies as a significant milestone toward the development of unmanned submarine hunters. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed today's video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, and while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time for another amazing video right here on American Eye.